So, so John, you in Kiev covering the war and the invasion of Vladimir Putin's army. It's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning there on the seventh day of this invasion. What is it like? Well, I'll show you this, Manuel. Uh, this is a piece of a, a Russian missile that's, um, which I went to the main TV tower in Kiev, which is a few miles. It's uh, about 17 uh, minutes in the car um, from the center. And um, uh, they hit the TV tower last night. Um, curfew was curfew bites at eight o'clock in the evening. So there were people out and the and I, I was actually the first person to get into the TV tower complex. Um, I thumbed a ride and a um, nice guy gave me a lift. Soldiers are very tense. There are checkpoints. I mean, it's crazy. I got here on Valentine's Day, Manuel. I've had a lot of bad Valentine's days in my time, but this was this was the worst. Uh, but it was a piece. Kiev was a piece. It's astonishing. Anyway, I get in and I get, uh, meet a guy called Ross, who's a soldier. He's got a gun. They check me out. I'm British. I used to work for the BBC, blah, blah, blah. I get in and um, Ross shows me around. And um, what you see is a, a building which has been smashed. Uh, it's a foggy morning, and so the TV tower is still standing. It's um, it's kind of lost in the uh, in the early morning fog, or the, the top part of it is, but it's still standing. But what the Russians have done is attacked the um, the, the complex um, at the base, which is critical for uh, for the tv the tv signal to go out i believe which is why it's off air at the moment uh, and there was uh, a patch of bright red blood on the ground uh, they've taken away the corpse but the um, um his blood was still there he was a worker and then ross this guy who was my guide with the uh, with the gun uh, took me um, through the back end of the complex across the street and there's a shopping complex. And what had happened was I think four missiles hit the area. Two of them hit the complex itself, the transmitter in the, its base. But the other two hit a group of a line of shops. Two people died. One of them was an old man, the old morgue. The people from the morgue were taking him away as always there. And then they took away a mother and a child. Um, so the killing of children and women started in Kiev. There is a column marching, inching its way towards the city where you're in. What What's going to happen next? What What are the people of Kiev expecting? Well, it, it reminds me of the kind of the traffic jams in Malta, frankly, uh, inspired by uh, Joseph Muscat, because he's never built a proper metro in Malta. So what you've got is this kind of long line of of heavy metal but at the moment it's 15 miles away or rather the front end of it's 15 miles away it's 40 miles long so the back end is probably still in russia or belarus but it's sitting there and there's some kind of weird stalemate my working hypothesis on the on the armored column is the ukrainians have got enough western kit now to blow it to blow it up um, to kill an awful lot of Russian soldiers. But if I think, I think if they do that, they fear that, uh, that Vladimir Putin will use this as an excuse mm -hmm. to, to blitzkrieg Kiev, and therefore they're not doing it. I would hate to be a Russian squaddy sitting in that armored column waiting to die. And that's what Putin is, is doing with these people. So at the moment, it's a kind of bizarre Mexican standoff, but it does remind me of a Maltese traffic jam. Uh, <laughs> the, the sense I get then is that Vladimir Putin has more options than he's used so far. Um, and, and there's some concern uh, on the other side that they might provoking him into using some rather more unpleasant ones. Yeah, so I, I don't think he's going to use the nukes. I think that's got a Damarung, and I don't think he's going to do that. I don't think, so I've got a 
there's a pal of mine uh, called Simeon Gloosman. You can look him up on Wikipedia, but he's great. He's the president of my favorite organization in the whole world, which is the Ukrainian Psychiatric Association. And weirdly, um, uh, because I did my uh, I've, I did my a panorama report on Scientology, uh, the Ukrainians invited me because uh, Scientology was mucking around in Ukraine and the Ukrainian Psychiatric Association invited me out to Lviv in 2016 and I met Semyon. Semyon is a great hero because he was the first Soviet psychologist back in 71 to challenge the Soviet abuse of psychiatry and for his courage he spent 10 years in the gulag um, and he's 75 I interviewed the, uh, the other day before the war and uh, we filmed it and, and then we had a we cracked open a, a bottle of cognac and boy can the old fella drink so he's a proper zek at Russian for a political prisoner and this old guy he still is so I asked him about Putin's long table and um, uh, Semin said the distance between him and his death beautiful line is he mad no said Semin. i do not think he's mad i think he's bad i think he's becoming like hitler and i think and i kind of shuddered inwardly at that because i think hitler's in a special circle of hell all on his own but in terms of invading places like czechoslovakia and then poland now that the war started putin is like that my, my particular take on Putin is that I think Semyon's right. He's not hallucinating. He's not a schizophrenic. He doesn't have voices in his head. This means, by the way, he's culpable for his actions, which I think is part of Semyon's reasoning. But I also think that he's built himself a bunker, um, a bunker which has become a prison or a dungeon of his own devising, which is so below ground and so dark, there is no light and he cannot see um what is happening um he cannot he does not understand the 21st century and he's seeing the world with with the soviet prism in fact the prism of a soviet kgb officer and he doesn't understand how the 21st century has moved very much on and people in ukraine really get democracy and fun and life and all of that so part of the extraordinarily intense experience of being here under fire with the Ukrainian people is to share their laughter, is, 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 is to share their courage. Um, the guy who showed me around the complex with his gun, who pointed out that the Russians, you know, they're, they're miss they've got good kit, their, their missiles are accurate. They're not that accurate because they kill the woman and child. But I said to Ross, what did you do before the war? And he said, oh, I was a hot air balloon pilot and I, and I booked a ride. Uh, <laughs> and, and everybody who's listening, who uh, it's our duty when all this horror is over to come out to Ukraine and spend our money uh, in Ukraine on holiday. Um, and um, I know that sounds silly, but, it, it, but part of the game of being here is to keep morale up. So whenever I walk down the street, I just go, I just say with my obvious and I'm wearing a, a duffel coat, the kind of which Major Calloway wore in the movie The Third Man. I've got my silly orange hat on. And I just go around saying good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A bit like John Cleese. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm trying to to um, to communicate that 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 the eyes and ears of the Western world are here. Um, I, I wanted to speak to you a bit about your experience of this. This is far from your first rodeo. You're, you're a veteran war correspondent. You've, you've been all over the place. Ma Manuel, I know what, how is this the same? Well, so Manuel, OK, I'm, I know that no one's watching and no one's listening. So I can this is almost private between you and me. Sure. So I was actually inside the tower complex this morning. I was the first journalist there and I couldn't I didn't have enough. I haven't worked out my phone sims and all of that stuff, so I can only properly push stuff out on Twitter once I'm back at my flat. So, but, but I was I was the first reporter there, and I and I actually 
sort of as a kind of professional basis. I mean, okay, the BBC got rid of me, but I thought actually, John, that's not bad. Uh, and I uh, and I, uh, I I got in there first, um, which was good. So this isn't my first rodeo. So. I haven't done the washing up. I haven't had breakfast. The moment I could, the moment coffee was lifted, I stood out in the street, put my thumb out, and there's some driver, a guy called Vlad, picked me up and took me there. Lots of checkpoints on the way, but I kind of know what I'm doing. I've got a nice flat, which I've uh, rented through Airbnb. I've got this. The Ukrainian authorities have banned the sale of alcohol. Oh, fuck's sake, you can edit this, can't you? Um, but um, <laughs> I won't bother though, it, 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 it illustrates your mood. So. But I've got I've got a uh, two bottles of actually, have I got I've got only I've got one and a half bottles of Italian red left, but I've got a bottle of whiskey, two bottles of gin, and a bottle of rum. Now, now for some people, that's a year stock. In, in my case, it's even longer than that. It's going to last till Wednesday, next Wednesday, but you're covering war. So, so but, but it's I'm a drinker if I was uh, back at home in the library, uh, but never mind. So, uh, so I'm, I'm joking. These are funny things. But basically, uh, I am doing um, the traffic I'm getting on my Twitter feed is very good and it's very, very positive. And I'm I know how to do this and I'm 63. Um, and so, you know, if I'm unlucky and I'm hit by a Russian rocket, I've had a, I've had a great ride and I've enjoyed it. And at the same time, I'm doing what I love the best, which is telling truth to power, sticking up for um, for the, the people who sticking up for the aristocracy of the human soul. So exactly. It's the same story as standing up. The Daphne and her legacy in Malta is the same story here in the and, and it's virtually the same enemy in, in that uh, with your you're fighting ignorance and stupidity and greed and corruption. This time armed with far more terrifying weapons, but it's the same fight pretty much against the same kind of people. I, I wanted to make some of those connections. Um, in, in, in you being there and giving us the Twitter feed and, you know, obviously your colleagues working for larger organizations as well. Um, you're, you're on the front line of an information war as well. The EU banned uh, Russia TV and Sputnik, although Russia TV still shows on Maltese distribu- distributors, if you, if you believe. Um, how, how do you connect the um, propaganda that has been coming out of Russia over the last years and over the last days and hours with uh, the physical war that they're fighting? Well, the one flows from the other, as it did with Nazi Germany, the hatred of Jews, the hatred of the other, the hatred of the um, of the foreign powers created an environment, a poison cloud of hate, which people breathed in. And if you breathe in this stuff for long enough, you start to believe it. I actually don't think it's worked here. I think that there is, uh, and that that is partly because Ukraine is full of Russians and Russians are full of Ukrainians. They are brothers and sisters or cousins and they know each other. And people, there are Russian soldiers who will have grandmas in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Maripol. And they know each other and they kind of love each other. If you can imagine, listen, I am no fan of the Scottish National Party. I want the United Kingdom to stay whole. If Scottish nationalism succeeds, then England and Scotland will be separated and I would be sad. However, I would not ever, ever subscribe to an English invasion of Scotland, not ever. And at that moment, I would say this is completely wrong. And I would and and I think what's happening in Russia is that if Russia is England, then there are Russians who are getting stronger, who are saying this is wrong. This is a bad war. Also, this is a, something else. So I think these personal connections between families, my grandma's Ukrainian and I'm a Russian soldier. And my granny sends me an email or a phone message and that the, the connections are still working then that is going to override the hate from the Russian propaganda machine. 
And, I, you know, for anybody to protest now on the streets of Moscow is an act of courage. There are tens of thousands of people doing it. And, and, and that, although it's not hundreds of thousands or millions, it's enough to shake the regime. Plus the fall in the ruble, plus the fact that you can't use your Apple Pay anymore in Moscow. I mean, it's hurting Putin big time. So although he's got many more darker military options, thermobaric bombs, big missiles, cruise missiles, he could smash this place to pieces. I don't think he's got full control of his military machinery. I think this massive army, I mean, I said this actually, I'm boring, but there we are. Uh, you're used to that by now, Manuel. The, um, he hasn't, I thought on the very first morning, if the electricity was still on in Kiev and the internet was still working, things weren't going well for Putin. And I was right about this. So this, you know, your Maltese traffic jam of, of, of armor that's stuck there, not moving. Um, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the Russian army should come to Malta, but it, <laughs> although some of them have obviously got their passports, thank, thanks to Henry and partners, all concerned, deny any wrongdoing. However, uh, it's not working. And the Ukrainians are really fighting. And, and so Semyon's, I asked Semyon, my psychiatrist friend, are you going to fight? He said, no, I'm too old. I don't want to kill anyone. I don't, I don't do that. But if they come to the streets, I will protest. I don't want to die, but I will protest. And it goes for everybody. It, it, it is a thing of beauty. Here, on this side, the Ukrainian side, you can watch and see the aristocracy of the human soul every four or five minutes. And on the Russian side, for the moment, dignity and honor and truth have been extinguished. Was the response from the European Union um, perceptible in, in, in the streets that you're, that you're walking? I haven't, I've got, the, the, the problem is you have kind of, so I got to. I got. To, I went down to the tube station the other day, and the, the world's deepest tube station on Earth is the Arsenal tube station in Kiev, and that basically it's underneath this great big cliff where the Rus founded the Russian civilization, which is also obviously the Ukrainian civilization, but here, not in Moscow, a thousand years ago, and this cliff is a natural citadel, and the in 1960. Um, um, they built, the Soviet Union built this incredibly, incredibly deep um, tube. And it was packed with humanity hiding from the Russian army. Um, and there's two kids and a little dog on their phone. And you, you just go, oh, God, I, I can't imagine it. And then, there, but the adults, their faces are kind of frozen with fear. Their eyes are too wide. People collide into each other. It's like muscles are scribbled with fear. And, 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 and so you don't have proper conversations about the impact of the European Union because people, people are too scared. I've got to go and get some, some water, some loo rolls, some, some, uh, I've got to move my mum uh, from this place to that place, all of that stuff. Um, but I think as somebody who voted Remain, in uh, in 2016 in London, I'm voting Remain in Kiev uh, by being here, and I was intensely proud, intensely proud of the European Union that uh, they have said to every Ukrainian, "You're welcome to stay in our country for three years." While the British government is still faffing around, part of the joy of Brexit, we were told, was that now we can make quick decisions. Well, the Home Office and the British are still working on that issue. The European Union is already there and Ukraine has applied. And I wish um, for that uh, their application to be successful. And I think people are getting that, but it's hard to have a, a nuanced and complicated conversation because people are so afraid. I'll go to my final question about governments faffing about. Um, the invasion of Ukraine started a day or two after the electoral campaign started here in Malta. And even now, 
the Maltese government uh, is rejecting calls to stop selling passports to Russians, to Russian oligarchs, to Russian millionaires. You've, with me and with Carlo Bonini, we, we've, we've worked on murder on the Malta Express. And one of the chapters was about selling passports principally to Russian oligarchs. And that wasn't a time of war. How, how, how do you feel knowing that Malta insists it, it, it wants to continue um, giving a way out to, to Putin's friends? This is wrong because what they're doing is they're allowing a backdoor for evildoers to escape the consequences of their evil actions. And this is wrong. As well as it being wrong, it's also stupid because you know, smell the coffee. President Joe Biden, who's in trouble domestically, is about to bounce back because he has just done an astonishingly powerful State of the Union address in which he's told the United States that we are going for the oligarchs ill gotten gains. And if the corrupt and stupid and moronic greedy government of Malta, Joseph Muscat with lipstick on, continue to supply um, escape avenues for dirty money and passports via Henley and partners to dirty Russian evildoers, then be aware that the Western world and democracy and the power of the United States, and in particular, the Southern District of New York is going to come for you and you will not like that. So what the Maltese government is doing is wrong and it's stupid. And if I was them, I would dump this nonsense, this corrupt nonsense as quickly as possible, because otherwise they may find themselves behind bars along with the passport buyers. John Sweeney in Kiev, thank you very much. Cheers and go well. By the way, I can't wait to go back to Malta and have a proper, beautiful Maltese meal. With you, so we hope.